Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Active Ingredients Worth the Investment, sponsored by Premier Tech and powered by Greenhouse Management Magazine. I am Matthew J. Grassi, editor of Greenhouse Management Magazine. I'm so glad you could join us today. Now, really quickly, before we hear from our speaker, I have a few housekeeping notes to go over. This presentation is being recorded and it will be available in five to seven days on our website, greenhousemag.com. If you have questions for our speaker, you can ask them at any time by using the Q&A function in your Zoom taskbar there at the bottom of the window. The views expressed during this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily Greenhouse Management Magazine or GIE Media. This virtual presentation does not constitute an endorsement of the vendor, our speaker's views, products, or services. <clears throat> All righty, with that out of the way, I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Lance Lawson with Premier Tech. Mr. Lawson, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, appreciate everybody being here today. Um, we'll get, let's see. There we go. We'll get started here. Um, as Matthew said, our topic today is active ingredients uh, worth the investment for growing media. Um, so we're going to be talking about different active ingredients that can be added to growing media and also that benefit plants and plant growth. Um, what are active ingredients? Uh, active ingredients are biological living more, uh, microorganisms. Um, most of us know them as bacteria or fungi or their byproducts. Um, they're used to enhance plant growth, reduce pathogens, um, and also they can help um, reduce insect populations. Uh, the two general categories uh, we'll touch on today are biostimulants and biocontrols. Um, so active ingredients uh, for growing media, there's three different types. There's a fungi, streptomyces, and bacteria that we'll be, we'll be looking at. Um, for biostimulants, um, they're used primarily in the plant root zone. Uh, the microorganisms uh, attach themselves or colonize to plant root systems. Um, they're mainly bacteria or fungi, such as mycorrhizae, which we'll touch on here in a minute. And the things they do, uh, they help the, enhance the plant growth by fostering uh, faster root growth, um, more developed root system, and can help give a shorter crop time. So you can have a, a, a quicker turn on your crops. And they are compatible with most chemical controls um, just check the label uh, on the chemical that you're going to use and make sure that they they will be good with it. But they uh, most of these will go with any of the chemical controls that you want to use also. Just wanted to show a picture of uh, root stimulation. Here you can see on the left is a control in a petri dish of a plant being grown. And on the right, you can see uh, bacillus pumulus has been added and how it enhances the uh, root hair system on that plant, both uh, on top and bottom. So first we'd like to touch on uh, mycorrhizae. Um, there's two types. Uh, first, there's ectomycorrhizae, and that'll colonize most trees and shrubs. Um, it's ideal for nurseries that they're looking to, you know, use a mycorrhizae to help um, in the you know the plant health of their trees and shrubs, the very few colonize uh, greenhouse crops such as annuals, perennials, vegetables. Uh, they don't harm harm the plants at all if they're there, but the plant just doesn't make that connection, and there's no real benefit. Um, the second type is endomycorrhizae, and that colonizes with most of the herbaceous plants grown in greenhouses and at nurseries and things like that, um, you know, such as the annuals, perennials, the vegetables we grow, uh, it'll colonize with 80 to 85% or more of all plants grown. And it provides uh, probably the biggest benefit for these 
uh, for greenhouse growers in these plants. Um, and a few of them, a few of the endomycorrhizae species will colonize with a few types of trees and shrubs. So they can be used there. Uh, I just wanted to show you a list, uh, I'll leave up for just a second, of the species available. So um, you can see there's endomycorrhizae, has all these species. Uh, one of the main ones used um, in growing media uh, is Glomus interatices and then also the ectomycorrhizae and um, a lot, of, a lot uh, of available options come with multiples of these so you can cover a wide range of plants that you're, you're trying to, to colonize. Uh, so the main, the main one we wanna talk about today is endomycorrhizae uh, because it benefits, you know, there's more benefit for greenhouse and nursery crops. Um, Mycorrhizae is, is a natural product. It's in the soil already. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fungus, it's not a GMO. Um, the hyphae of a mycorrhizae colonize with, with the roots and then they extend that root system out to help uh, increase the total absorptive area um, that the roots can reach to, to take up water and nutrients. And full colonization usually takes three to six weeks. Uh, it'll start, you know, pretty quickly, but it to get fully colonized for the plant root system, it takes up to three to six weeks. Um, it'll help improve acquisition and uptake of, uh, you can see the, the phosphorus, copper, manganese, zinc, um, and other fertilizers. It also help get out there and find more available water for the plant. Um, the plant in turn uh, provides mycorrhizae with carbohydrates, starches that help it live. And then there's also some protection from some pathogens that might uh, harm um, the mycorrhizae. Um, there's another thing mycorrhizae does is it helps reduce effects of environmental stresses. So as your plant can go through stresses at different stages, it helps reduce this. And actually the greater stress put on a plant, you'll see a greater benefit of the mycorrhizae compared to a non-treated plant. Um, it can help minimize nutrient deficiencies um, when, when they're there and uh, it's, it'll grow with the plant um, through the plant life cycle, which is very beneficial. Some benefits uh, to the grower uh, include uh, reduction of nutrient and water stress to your crops, uh, faster plant establishment, so your crop time can be you know, quicker and shorter. Um, it'll give you enhanced crop quality and uniformity. And um, there's also a reduction of plant loss, and, which can benefit, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's easy to use. Usually it's incorporated into the growing media or you can um, incorporate into the growing media at your location. For the retailer um, or garden center, it helps plants tolerate uh, you know, improper fertilization and watering that may go on. And it's gonna help extend the shelf life and reduce losses there also. So it's, um, I'm gonna, one second, please. There we go. I just needed to hide something on my screen. Um, so it'll help help you know at at the garden center. And so if you're a, a grower and you want that a, an extra advantage as it goes out to the re retailer or garden center, uh, definitely mycorrhizae can help give that to you. And then for the end user or the consumer that's buying the plant, it's going to help with uh, improved transplant survival and transplant shock. So it doesn't go through that as quick. It helps the plant get through that. And it's gonna uh, also help the plant survive the effects of nutrient and water stress at, at, the, at the consumer's home or business or wherever it may be. And you can see, uh, uh, we have a picture here um, on, the, on the left is an untreated versus a treated uh, growing media with endomycorrhizae in it. You can see the, the size and, and uniformity of the plant difference. Uh, so there's different applications. 
there's a granular which is incorporated into growing media before planting, um, either, as I said, either by the growing media producer or um, by you as a grower uh, at your location. There's a powder um, form that you can mix with water and you can do a post plant drench, uh, but you need to keep it agitated. You need to keep the mycorrhizae in, in the, in the uh, solution or it, it can fall out, or you can do a root ball coating or uh, dip for your cuttings. Um, and the amended uh, growing media, the advantage to that is there's no extra labor costs to apply it or to add it yourself. And there's no costly application errors. So, you know, it's, it's there and it's, it's ready to go. Um, typical crop loss, um, and you can see the reference uh, that I've used here below, um, or shrinkage, um, has been quoted at, uh, at the grower, it's three to 5%, uh, at the retail, anywhere from five to 15%. And mycorrhizae fungi can help uh, reduce this um, when there's improper watering and fertilization and the environmental stresses that go on. As we all know, you know, sometimes the plants are all of a sudden put into a really hot environment uh, where they're at at the, the retail locations and, you know, they're, they're stressed pretty good. And, but mycorrhizae can help uh, reduce um, this shrink and help the plants uh, survive this. So an example uh, of shrinkage at the grower, uh, if you took 20,000 10 inch hanging baskets um, and we just uh, pulled some average uh, prices, uh, you can see the source we use below, um, a wholesale price of 870, uh, you have a, a total value of $174,000. Um, going on the, uh, the low end, 3% loss would equal 600 baskets lost or uh, $5,220. With mycorrhizae, um, your average cost to add it or have it added uh, is $680, which comes out to be about 3.7 cents per basket. Um, it can reduce the shrink by 1.5%, which is 300 hanging baskets. And you times that by 870, the wholesale price, and you get a shrink reduction of $2,610. Um, that, that 2,610 gain or reduction, um, minus the $680 of your cost, it comes out to be a benefit of, or a net gain for the grower of almost $2,000. The other thing it does, the other thing mycorrhizae can help is, uh, just an overall improved growth and quality of your plants. So all the plants, the other plants, the other baskets that survived and did well, their, their growth and quality will be improved and will, it'll be a stronger plant and a more healthy plant. Uh, and then an example of the shrink that also can go on at a retail, the same 20,000 10 inch hanging baskets with the same wholesale price and, and value uh, but using a 10% loss, um, kind of in the middle, uh, is another 2,000 baskets or $17,400 in loss. With mycorrhizae, again, same average cost because it's already in there at $680 or three, you know, 3.7 cents per basket, roughly. Um, reducing the shrink by uh, 5%, um, which is on the low end equals a thousand hanging baskets and equals out to be eight eight thousand seven hundred dollars in shrink reduction and that minus your 680 cost um, for the mycorrhizae is eight thousand and twenty dollars roughly that you're getting in a net gain and again um, you know at the retail location you're seeing an improved growth and quality of plants for for all the plants there so a total shrink reduction um, combined together uh, on these 20,000 10 inch hanging baskets with the grower and the retailer comes out to be $9,950. So, you know, over a season, that's, that's a pretty good 
pretty good gain. And depending on what other crops you use it on or have it with uh, larger baskets or larger pots, then you'll, you can, you know, figure that out and see, see those, you know, gains that you can, you can achieve by using a mycorrhizae in your growing media. The other subject we'd like to touch on today is the biocontrols uh, for plant disease. Um, they're used to reduce, uh, to help reduce the, the need for foliar disease or the incidence of foliar disease and root disease. Um, they're a pre preventative protection. Uh, they, they help slow development of diseases or, or not let them begin. Uh, they can reduce plant loss and they Im definitely improve plant quality. Uh, this will help save money. Um, there's an added cost up front usually by having these added to your growing media, but it's going to help reduce the number of fungicide drenches along the way. Um, it helps reduce uh, the exposures to, pest to chemical pesticides at your location and can be used in combination with chemical controls if, if and when you need to do so. Uh, biocontrols in growing media, they, uh, I do want to stress they are preventative. They're, they're not a cure of an existing disease problems. They're in there to help prevent a disease uh, before it can uh, begin to populate and, and build up. Um, there's a, um, and adding a higher rate of a biocontrol doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a greater control. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that. Um, they can su suppress a broad uh, range of pathogens and um, you just need to observe the product label for what you're trying to, um, to go after. They're a useful tool in root disease control. Uh, they're, they are less effective in high disease pressures. So if you know you're having, you know, a crop that's, you know, really has a high disease pressure all the time, they will help, but they, they can be less effective. And many of the, many do have temperature restrictions. Um, some considerations of these, uh, they are living organisms, uh, which work differently, different than chemical pesticides. Um, in, in case of the root zone, the organisms, again, like we just keep wanting to stress this, uh, are preventative, not curative. So they're there to help prevent an issue. Um, they span the pathogen suppression is, is how they work. They suppress a path, pathogen's opportunity. Um, they do have, they can have uh, temperature and moisture restrictions during use. Um, Growing media temperatures below 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, you know, this, the effectiveness is, is less. Um, they, most of them are all pesticide compatible. Uh, again, check, check your labels. Um, some do have storage requirements such as they need to be stored, you know, in a fridge or kept cool, um, especially the fungal organisms. And then shelf life can range. Some have less than a year, some will be the over a year. And some, some of the products do require repeat application. So why use biocontrols? Um, one, one re, you know, some of the reasons are uh, you can reduce um, the, the incidence of, of root disease before it even gets going and which can help reduce plant loss. It'll save money um, uh, by reducing the number of fungicide drenches. Um, your cost is up front, but if you can cut back a few fungicide drenches, then it can definitely save there. Uh, preventative uh, approach protects the roots from pathogens, um, especially from slow development of root diseases over time uh, due to you know, watering or, uh, or other incidences. Um, It'll reduce exposure, you know, to you, for you and your, your employees to chemical pesticides. Um, it's just another option in your toolbox. And it can be an option for organ 
organic crops. Uh, some, some of the products out there are OMRI listed and can be used for your organic production. And then it can help, you know, give you peace of mind as you're growing your crop. Some advantages is that uh, safe to use, uh, minimal to no, you know, plant or human or animal toxicities for most of these. Uh, they're natural. Um, they've been discovered in the environment. Um, they compete for space and food with passage, pathogens and, and keep, keep it so they can't get to that. And they're just part of the normal checks and balances in our uh, natural environment and ecosystems. So they've been modified to help or brought in to help in the greenhouse. Um, they're less, uh, they, there's less potential for a pathogen to, to get resistance to them. Um, most, most products have little or no REI. Um, like I stated, some are OMRI listed and are great for organic use if you're growing organic crops. Um, they can have continued plant protection, protection for the grower, the retailer, and the consumer. And, um, you know, one of the trends these days is uh, consumers' preferences is for less chemical pesticides with everything, and, and you, you can achieve that with, with these. So the types of biocontrols for growing media, um, the fungal biocontrols, they do have, a, um, most of them do have a limited shelf life. Um, they're sensitive to environment like high temperatures. So they, a lot of them require cool storage. Um, and some uh, are sensitive to moisture or desiccation. Um, they're very effective when stored correctly and used correctly. The mode of action is parasitism. They're, they compete for um, the space there and keep, keep it protected. And they produce antibiotics to help protect the, the roots. Um, some of these products are Root Shield, uh, Root Shield Plus, and Soil Guard. And you can see who those are by. Um, another type is uh, Streptomyces biocontrols. Um, they do have temperature restrictions are variable. So some do, some don't. Uh, they can have a longer shelf life. Uh, the, the mode of action for them is uh, cell wall degradating enzymes. Uh, of, and they also produce antibiotics. And again, competition for that space around the roots. Uh, and some of these products are Actinovate and Microstop. And then there is uh, some bacteria controls. Uh, they have a long shelf life and uh, most of them have a wider temperature tolerance range and um, they're less susceptible to desiccation. Uh, the mode of action for these is they, you know, an antibiotic production and, and again, competition for that space and they protect the root that way. Uh, these products include uh, uh, Rhapsody, Serenade, Companion Max, and then also Promix Biofungicide uh, Pro and Promix Biofungicide plus Mycorrhizae. Um, the difference there you can see with the, the biofungicide and biofungicide mycorrhizae is in the registration. When it's biofungicide is alone, it just has a hyphen. When it's with mycorrhizae, the registration has it as, as both, as, as just a full word. Um, an example uh, of bio, uh, a biofungicide is Bacillus pumilus and uh, PTB 180, which is incorporated into growing media. Um, after planting, uh, a, a biofilm is formed around the root system within 24 to 48 hours by this bacterium. Um, and this biofilm then competes for that space as, as I've talked about, and it helps reduce the incident of root disease ca caused by uh, Fusarium, Pythium, and Rhizoctonia. And you can see in the pictures, uh, it actually, um, a biofungicide or biostimulant 
uh, actually um, will enhance the root hair uh, growth, which helps the plant take up uh, water and nutrients better. And also you can see in the other picture here, the biofilm, which is, is generated around the, the root. Uh, we just wanted to show this picture. This is a picture over on the left part of your screen as you're looking at it, you, where, it where it says inoculation point, that is the root, the actual root. Um, you can see all the webbing is the mycorrhizae hyphae. And then you can see the mycorrhizae spores. Um, and then you can also see where the bacillus has started forming that growth around some of the mycorrhizae and also it's, it's around uh, the root edges. So it, it not only protects the roots, but it'll start to grow and extend itself and protect the mycorrhizae uh, system that's in place. Uh, we wanted to show some, some trials and studies that have been done. On the left is some impatients that have been inoculated with uh, rhizoctonia. Um, on the left in that picture, you can see the, the plants or the growing media that was treated with Bacillus pumilus, how the plants are doing, and then the untreated. And then there's geranium uh, on the right, some geraniums that were inoculated with pythium. And again, on the left of that picture is Bacillus pumilus was, um, it is in the growing media, and then the untreated side. And these are Rex begonia, begonia cuttings, if I can get the words out. Um, on the left, again, the biofungicide was, was used and on the right, um, it's untreated cuttings. Um, and here is some pansies um, that has bum, uh, the pumulus and the mycorrhizae added to the ones on the left and then the untreated ones on the right. And you can see the difference in plant growth and color. I hope that picture comes through like it should. So you can see that. And another screen of active ingredients being added um, in patients with, uh, with both bacillus, pumulus and mycorrhizae and, and untreated. You can see the size and color of those that are treated and also the salvia. Um, these are just different trials that have been done. And, and um, we wanted to show this table for, for fungicide control comparison. You can see that you know, different, different uh, ones um, you know, take different different action. And, and so it's good to know what you need to, to, to do and, and go after and choose the right product. So just a quick review for um, using uh, biofungicides. Uh, cost of, to, to do a drench, a chemical drench on 10,000 six inch azalea pots is anywhere from 150 to $800, depending on the chemical. Uh, and that's not including labor. And the crops, uh, you know, depending on the crop or, or what is going on, it can require one to three drenches per cycle. Um, Promix has both biofungicide and mycorrhizae uh, included um, for the active ingredients. So it's already incorporated. Uh, in the growing media, so there's no cost to apply. Uh, it can reduce uh, chemical drenches by 50% or more, which can then uh, result in savings of up to five, for anywhere from 500 to $1,200 for a typical crop. And, um, you know, of course that depends on uh, the chemical, the other chemicals and the drenches and the container size. And um, we do, if you're interested uh, in, in you know, trying to calculate some of this out, we do have a, a cost calculator that can help uh, show this, the savings at our website, pthorticulture.com, pth, or pthorticulture, sorry, dot com. 
um, you can go there and um, it's, it's available for you to be to use. Uh, the average cost of biocontrol in a uh, cubic yard of media. Um, so the cost of an active ingredients based uh, on an average of $17.25 per cubic yard. Uh, if you had the number of pots, azalea pots, 1944, or hanging 10 inch hanging baskets, 144, you can see the costs uh, per pot. And then the selling price, so the active ingredient is half a percent for the azalea and 1.4% roughly for um, the hanging 10 inch hanging baskets. Uh, the savings uh, for one cubic yard of growing media, uh, this is at the grower's location uh, for, for that same number of pots and hanging baskets um, with a crop value of 3,032.64 or $1,200 roughly. Um, your plant loss without active ingredients at 5% is $151 for the azalea pots, $60.90 for the hanging baskets. Um, active ingredient investment is $17.25 for, for both um, per cubic yard of growing media. So the reduction of loss or your added revenue is for the azalea pots, it's 80, almost $83. For a hanging basket, it's baskets, it's $23. In summary, uh, just to kind of summarize all that that we went over, uh, there's a wide choice of active ingredients available for growers to, to be able to use. Uh, each has a specific application. So know your application and what you want to achieve. And um, then you can choose from there. They're all pretty easy to use. Um, most common for growth enhancement and uh, is biofungicide. Um, they can complement your IPM programs that you already have in place. Uh, remember to check your label for applications. You can, you know, you'll be able to see a used improvement of and crop in performance. And it's important to note that many are uh, OMRI listed uh, for organic standards. And we know that there's, especially in vegetables, there's more and more demand for organic grown. So there's, there's multiples of these that can be used uh, for that. Um, we'd like to thank you for your participation today. And uh, I'll turn the time back over to I don't know if somebody's going to help me with questions. Hey, Lance. There we go. All right, I'm back. All right, we got a few questions here in the chat. Um, I'll just start right in on them. So the first question is, um, what are some best practices that can contribute to increasing the population of mycorrhizae when you're talking about open field as well as nursery production? Um, one of the best practices is, is once you get it uh, applied in the, in the right amount, uh, make sure you look at the directions of the, of the product that you're going to use. Once you get it applied, uh, make sure that you don't re-disturb that area uh, because that's what usually damages or harms the mycorrhizae. And then just give it a good opportunity to get established and going. Uh, so, you know, water it. Um, water it well, just so just anything you're going to do to make the plant survive well is going to make the mycorrhizae survive well. Lance, that brings up a question I've always had. Something I've heard with mycorrhizae is that um, if you water very uh, extensively to runoff that you might be washing away some of those mycorrhizae microbes. Is that true or not? Not usually. Um, okay. They're pretty stable in, in that soil environment. And they don't really move those spores, you know, get in, get into that airspace and find their space and they don't usually get washed away. Unless you had, you know, you'd spread a bunch of mycorrhizae on top and then you just, you know, it would wash that way. But once it's down in that soil environment and that root zone environment, it usually doesn't tend to wash away. 
All right, looks like we've got some new questions coming in, so we won't have to do many more of mine. Um, Lance, <laughs> what kind of beneficial microbes would you suggest in a recirculating hydroponics system? Um, probably some of these, uh, some of the bio, you could look to see, you'd really need to look, um, or you could get hold of us and we could help you uh, look at what would best match your system because there's multiple systems out there. So I hate to just say, oh, just do this one, but different one, different of the different ones of the bio program will work in that system, but we could help you identify those if you get hold of us. And um, I think our phone number and emails will be available and then we could help help you pick out one of those that would best work for your system. All right, we've got some good ones coming in here, Lance. Um, when, you, when you're referring to temperature sensitivity, is that referring to storing the active ingredients or is that actual soil temps that you want to avoid to keep those microbes moving along and doing their job? Uh, both, uh, usually first off, it's usually storage. So some of them do have a temperature they need to be stored at. Um, or they can, or it can hurt the product. So some require, like when you get them, you need to put them in the refrigerator to keep them cool. But then, uh, you also, if, I mean, in most of them, once they're into the soil, uh, profile, it's got to get pretty hot to, to hurt those, you know, well over a hundred, 105 degrees before it's going to hurt them. But it, usually it's the storage of them that you want to be careful with. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. Um, do these products change the pH of the growing media? I would guess not, but no. Yeah. Not in, not in any case that I know of. And then we have a commercial orchid grower who wonders, will mycorrhizae and ProMix uh, help his orchids uh, get rooted faster? Uh, there are a few crops that um, mycorrhizae doesn't really colonize with, and I don't have that full list in front of me right now, but again, if you want to email me, uh, I can double check that and I will get back to you. All right, so James, maybe uh, wait for Lance to share his email here at the end and then give him an email with that question. He could help you out. Yeah. Um, let's see another one. What if the soil is very saline and uh, and it has just a history of fusarium infection? Um, will, will microbes still work well in that type of scenario? Um, they they may not work well, but they can help, especially if they're already in a plant that's you know been grown in a pot and transplanted into that. If that protection has already been built up around the root systems, that'll stay with that plant and help it um, survive better and fight off the fusarium. But if it's a really high fusarium, you know, colonization anyway, it, it's the effectiveness will be less, but it will still help. And in that scenario, would you want mycorrhizae or is it a different? Mycorrhizae could, could be beneficial to help uh, uptake water and, and some of the other nutrients where it's so saline. Excellent. Lance, something I, another question I've had, uh, I use mycorrhizae in my own backyard uh, plants. Is there a minimum container size? I've been told that, uh, that you want to avoid using too small of containers because for whatever reason, maybe that they don't colonize as well in, in the smaller volume of soil. Is that, is that factual? Yeah, so uh, mycorrhizae, uh, let me go back here. We can, so you can see here, mycorrhizae starts out as these little spores. And um, those spores are basically what you're getting most of the time in if you buy mycorrhizae. And it's got a carrier. And if you're trying to add that to a very small cell size, you don't get as many of those spores in there to colonize with the roots. Wow. We, Promix doesn't usually, and I don't know of, of any other growing media producer that usually will put it in their plug mixes because of that, because they're such small. They usually go to the 
the growing, you know, media size so that when you step those plugs up to the four inch, six inch and that, then it's in there and that root system can get to more viable spores to begin growing. I see. That makes sense. Excellent. And then finally, the last question that we have as of right now, can these products be stored outdoors during the winter uh, without loss of efficacy? Uh, the if you're looking at the pro mix you know coming in the pro mix itself yes they can and they'll be fine um we usually with the pro mix we usually say you know we want you to store anywhere from nine to 12 months which you know a lot of times is through winter it doesn't hurt the mycorrhizae or the bacillus um we know we've done studies where we know both the mycorrhizae and the bacillus last up to two years in the ProMix. Some of the other products, um, you know, they need to be stored, like I said, in a fridge or something. So you'd really need to check those labels. But the ProMix with the bio and the mic in it, they can be stored outside over the winter and, and uh, you know, be used in the spring and they'll be fine. All right, we actually just had one more coming, uh, Lance. Is it safe to use zero tall or other such uh, fungicidal products as a foliar application? Or are mycorrhizae super sensitive to uh, that type of, of uh, application? Um, the mycorrhizae shouldn't be, if it's used properly, it shouldn't be sensitive to that, especially if it's a foliar. Um, you just want to make sure you follow the instructions on, on the product label. Um, usually what I tell growers that I'm working with is if it's not going to harm the plant, it probably won't harm the mycorrhizae. Because once the mycorrhizae is colonized, you know, it's, it's living off the plant. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship. So if you harm that plant, it, you know, it's going to start to harm what it does for the mycorrhizae and vice versa. So... One other thing I just wanted to, to mention quick, uh, sorry, um, is another article that you can refer to if, if you're looking for some more information we have on our uh, website is reducing crop shrinkage with active ingredients. And it's by Mr. Ed Bloodnick. And it, it does a great job of uh, uh, touching on everything that I touched on and going further into explanation of what I touched on today. So that's available on our website. Excellent. And then we had one more come in. Um, Lance, can PTB180 be used at seed planting? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, in ProMix, we put PTB180 in our um, plug mixes so that it can it, it, we can guarantee enough population in the plug mixes that it will begin working then. And it can actually help with root establishment and germination and, and things like that. Excellent. Well, it looks like those are all the questions we have for you, Lance. Um, I appreciate you sharing this really useful, very practical information about uh, keeping those microbes healthy and happy in your soil there. Uh, very useful stuff for growers. Just a quick reminder that we did record this presentation, so it will be available on our website, greenhousemag.com, under the sponsored webinars tab on the homepage. You find it in the drop downs there at the top of uh, greenhousemag.com. That should be posted which, within uh, five to seven days of uh, this recording. Other than that, that's all I have for you. Lance, if you have any final words, I'll, I'll leave you to uh, leave the audience with, with uh, your last words here. No, I appreciate the time and uh, I appreciate being able to share this and I hope it's useful for everyone and everybody has a great season. Same here. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Premier Tech, for your support again. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.